Hello, this is Kaylee with the Warrior Painters podcast. You're about to listen to a conversation between me and Ben Zhu, the owner and founder of Gallery Nucleus, a well-known art gallery based in Los Angeles. Ben has so many interesting stories to share, both about the art gallery business and his own artistic pursuit. You'll learn about how he takes pride in promoting entertainment art and entertainment artists to the general public. Ben also gives very helpful suggestions for artists who are interested in showing their work at galleries. We'll start with Ben introducing himself. So my name is Ben. I am the owner and manager of Gallery Nucleus. I founded it in 2004, and I've been running it ever since. I guess I'm an artist turned entrepreneur. Before I started Nucleus, I worked at a video game company. Called Spark. That's no longer in business, but they created、uh, Call of Duty One. And before I got into Call of Duty One and video games, I was in school. I graduated from、uh, Pasadena Art Center back in all the way in 2002. But I've always been doing art all my life, ever since I was I think, five years old.、Um, when I came to the U.S. at the age of seven, someone handed me a How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. And they also handed me a comic book. I think it was Spider-Man versus Punisher. And from that point on, I was like, I think I'm going to be an artist. And then cut to today, I'm totally not. <laughs> we'll get to that. But yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Is that I'm I'm primarily a gallery galleryist. That's what the, I think the proper term. I deal with retail and other stuff as well. What you said was interesting about how you really like to draw. And you really wanted to become an artist, and after you graduated in two years, you started Gallery Nucleus. <laughs> That was a very sharp turn for you. It was a 180. Yeah, all my friends、yeah. thought I was being strange, crazy. You know, just out of nowhere. I mean, even for myself, it was out of nowhere. I had wanted to get into animation when I was in high school. I was lucky enough to go to Roland Animation, and there was a really good program headed by a man named Dave Masters. I only had him for one year, but it was enough to inspire me for all four years. And、uh, after I graduated high school, I didn't get a job in animation right away. I knew I wanted to go to college, and I knew I wanted to go to art college. I decided on Art Center, and、um, I decided to get into illustration. So instead of going animation route, I decided to learn how to just draw and paint and more of the basics. But that led me to wanting to work in video games. I mean, I, I loved that first job, but after working in video games for like two and a half years, the game was pretty much wrapping up, and I felt like video games weren't quite for me, or at least not the position I was in. I didn't get to do as much、uh, visual development, as much painting and drawing as I had liked. Although I don't regret, you know, doing all the like texturing, lighting, 3D modeling. That's all actually really fun stuff, but it just wasn't quite for me. Did you try to apply to an animation studio after your game studio job? I didn't. I was about to. I thought about it. My friends were all in animation at the time. Slowly, my track was going to go into visual development. That's just you know when you get out of art center, that's what you got to do. So I had that one track mind, but I was at a weird crossroads in my life, where part family pressure, part soul searching, part just being a young. <laughs> I don't know, naive person. I thought I wanted to try, or I needed to try something completely different with my life. There was sort of pressure from my parents to help them take over their business, which is completely unrelated to art.、Um, I knew I didn't want to do that, and that that pressure was a big part of me, sort of reacting.、Um, Nucleus is sort of a reaction to that in some ways, where I don't want to do their business. But I felt like I needed to do something within the world of business, but on my own terms. So they really wanted you to do business. Oh yeah, ever since I was little, because they did business. I mean, it it helped them get to where they are, and they were fairly successful in business. And you know, this is the '80s. This is like being your own boss, all that stuff. And to them, the American dream was very much about being an entrepreneur. You know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they were not happy when you went into that game studio. They were happy.、Um, <laughs> my parent, my my dad was always pretty straightforward with me in that he wanted me to go to business school or you know learn business. To them, art is 
they don't you know they don't understand it which is which is fine they didn't, they weren't really artists they have an interest in like like my dad has an interest in photography but they're just you know they're chinese parents they're there they think like artists are not gonna you know make a decent living or things like that but w- would you say you were heavily influenced by their expectations for you? I don't want to say that either. I think if I don't, <laughs> I don't want to put the blame on them. You know what I mean? It was, it's not a blame. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, it's part. I, 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 it's just conflicting issues with this. But I definitely take responsibility for what I decided to do because when I did decide, my mom especially warned me about what it's like to get into business and how hard it is to sort of like stop doing business or get out of business. But earlier, what I was saying was their ideal for me was to basically take over for them and run their business. But I'm like, well, you sent me to art school. Why would you send me to go learn this one thing to only to like help you with this other thing that I have no interest in at all? It's like a, as if a, you know your fate is decided for you. And then you know I'm the only child, so that's mm-hmm. even that's a whole other different type of pressure. Right, right. So when you were talking about crossroads. The, it was mostly from your parents' influence because you were not married back then, right? No, no. Okay. But I was pretty much. I mean, I had just gotten out of a five-year relationship, and that was like, you know, you're young, so you, you. It's like a very weird time, and when you have a, such a serious relationship, you really do a lot of soul searching and kind of like figuring out what you want to do and where you, who you are, and all that stuff. Uh, it's kind of cliche now that I talk about it, but, <laughs> but that's where my head was at the time. I knew I was at a crossroads because I would either go vi- become a visual development artist, just be an artist for the rest of my life. I would be perfectly content doing that. But I also felt like, okay, I need to maybe explore this other avenue. And if I don't do it now while I'm still young, maybe I would just never do it. So I started Nucleus when I was 24. Yeah, you were really young. And you think you're going to do this for a long time? I had no idea how long I was going to do it for. You just don't think. That's the naive sort of optimism of a young person. But even, I mean, a lot of, it's not just young people. I think a lot of people who start businesses, they don't think that far into the future. Because if you're starting something new and unique, um, you know, if you're starting a hamburger shop, okay, maybe like the, the, the road has been paved for you. Like at the pinnacle, you can become McDonald's or something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But for what I was doing, I didn't know what the pinnacle was going to be. I didn't know. I was just trying to survive at those first, that first year, really, and just kind of learn. It's stupid because I had no business knowledge at all, you know. But speaking of which, how did you see this opportunity to focus on entertainment art? I guess in that respect, that was where I did. I do find it, kind of give myself credit is that I saw a need. Um, I myself am a huge illustration nerd. I do love art. I really strongly appreciate art. There's so many great artists around me at that time. And I was still learning about all the different types of art. Within animation alone, there was a ton of really amazing visual development artists. People who I thought had as much technical skill and could tell interesting stories as fine art painters. Um, To me, I mean, that's just the world I knew. That's the world I, I loved is because I was an art nerd. I collected art books and I thought, well, there's people love all these, like uh, they love the movies that these artists work on. Maybe they would love the art that the artists create or, you know, maybe they want to know more about these artists. So you didn't see anyone else doing similar things back then, even for like one-off events for, for some pop-up galleries? My eyes weren't that, open yet like I wasn't that aware of what was out there you know what I mean I knew there was a lot of art there was definitely some galleries showing like different artists but none of them I mean as far as entertainment art goes honestly it was like galleries in New York showed like you know people who did book covers back in like 1940s 50s 70s you know American illustrators but that's like Mm -hmm. galleries on the east coast right and that's all like old illustrations there's no where that I could see contemporary illustration or entertainment art. Even museums didn't show that stuff. The only, I think it was only like five, six years ago that they had the Tim Burton exhibit at the LACMA. I mean, like museums didn't do that. They just didn't, I don't know why. I mean, they were too like, I don't want to say that they were like snobby because that's not the case. I think they didn't realize that that's like something that people were really interested in or they just didn't think about it. But 
Tim Burton is, is he's an entertainment artist. That, that whole show at LACMA was like animation art, uh, you know, concept art, it's sculptures, it's all that stuff. So I, I wanted to be like, where can I go if I want to see like storyboards from Miyazaki? Where can I go if I want to see character designs from like Street Fighter or backgrounds from, uh, from whatever video game that, that's really popular right now? You know what I mean? Because to me, that stuff is, is art. I think it's, it holds as much weight and significance as a lot of the um, you know, fine art or like paintings or blue chip type galleries talking about like Damien Hirst or whatever. In terms of cultural relevance and significance, the, the comparison I like to make is like, if you could own the napkin drawing that JK Rowling made when she first thought of Harry Potter and like drew that first like stone gateway or whatever, that would be worth as much to me as like a Damien Hirst or something. You know what I mean? These things have re- extreme cultural and social relevance even sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's and true. Even, and even Damien Hirst, he's a commercial artist. I keep comparing him, but there's all type of these like sort of more upscale painters and abstract expressionism and things like that. I'm not knocking any of that stuff. I love that stuff. But at the end of the day, they're selling their art as a commercial product as well. Yeah, I guess the art world is probably transitioning into accepting entertainment art slowly. But it just, we don't see that that much right now, especially for traditional galleries. Yeah. I mean, I think in the 90s, animation cells, this is something I learned later on. I kind of saw it uh, when I was a kid in the 90s, where you would walk into like the Warner Brothers store and there'd be these like uh, framed replicas of cells. I mean, they were just printing this stuff. And some of the best like animation drawings of that era are owned by various collectors now. It's hard to find some of that stuff now. You know, the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess all the studios, those big studios, they they have their (laughs) storage and they have all this stuff. But it's just hard for the public to see and to really get to know how this stuff is made. Right. I mean, you have to be a hardcore collector to really know a lot of this stuff. Like, for example, they still have auctions for like Disney paraphernalia or like old Warner Brothers paraphernalia. But how do you find out about that stuff? If you're just a common person, there's no main street gallery that just, as far as I knew, you know, that just has that type of work. They'll have like prints. There's tons of galleries now that's very commercial that have like Dr. Seuss is still very, is very much a thing. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's all prints, you know, the originals are either locked away or they're long gone. And um, there's just galleries that just make money off of like really high end prints of old Dr. Seuss stuff. Yeah, I think also because entertainment art, a lot of times just digital art and people, a lot of people wouldn't see the value in owning one print because they're looking for that original painting. There's only one, that sort of feeling. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about that still. I think digital art is very, uh, it's a very valid art form. I mean, technique wise, it's just as amazing as regular, you know, real media. But it's really just the duplication aspect of it that that devalues it. People can take just as much time making a digital piece as they do a traditional piece. But it's owning that one off, you know, that one of a kind. There's still something to that in our minds, in a collector's mind. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, what a lot of these other art galleries do, you talk about like Thomas Kincaid, Wyland, all those guys, you know, you've seen them. You just don't realize they're, they're almost like invisible. I didn't start realizing them until I had my gallery. So there's all these galleries where it's like you go to a tourist area. It's like, oh, there's a lot of these whale paintings everywhere. And, or you go to like a, a cruise ship. You're like, oh, I'm stuck on this ship. And they keep wanting me to go to this like auction for, for these like, I don't know, whale paintings. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they're just, they're all prints of a real traditional media paintings. It's perception. So I know you do a lot of things still on location for your physical store but you have a big presence online as well. How do you see them going forward? Are you going to emphasize on one over the other or what, what is your plan? I think prior to COVID, we were still very focused on in-person events. I think mm-hmm. we were very known for in-person events. 
we just kind of became the gallery that likes to throw fun parties, not just like, you know, alcohol or whatever, but first, a lot of our shows, we would try to do something interesting, like have interactive elements, play games, raffles. It just felt more like an event to me when it comes to certain themes. Like for example, if you're going to go to a Korra avatar show or, you know, something that's related to a certain uh, property, people want to express their fandom in some other way besides like drinking alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like Disney knows, knows how to do it. They know how to get you to express that love in a way that pulls open your wallet. But at the end of the day, like we just, I, I very much want to make people just have, make people have a good time. And experiences are, are some of the best ways to do that. So I guess I just, we just kind of naturally gravitated towards that. Now, after COVID, we've stopped serving any sort of drinks or food or anything. We limit the number of people that can come in. We're very like careful and we've done a lot of more online events and things like that. To answer your question, I guess if all this went away tomorrow, I probably would go back to doing as many physical events and sort of fun in-person things and community driven things as I did before, because I just feel that so integral to what we do. But I would honestly, as a, from a business perspective, I would love to push harder online. I mean, if the online business could, could uh, improve, I would much rather have that as well. But as far as other trends, you know, we've seen people like do loot boxes and subscriptions, or like doing countdowns. The trends that don't go away are like people still want things that are coveted. People still want rare things. Mm -hmm. different platforms for selling i think that's the thing that uh, becomes different trends you know people are using tiktok to sell now they're using different apps to sell to connect with people whatever people are using we've we haven't tried that as much i'm sure we could probably do f try and follow these trends more but overall i'm um we're still just doing it through our physical store and just our, our website right there are some galleries, like purely online, digital galleries. They showcase people's art and stuff and get buyers to purchase. What, what's your opinion on that business model? This is almost not a question about model. I'm not sure I can easily answer because I myself am still trying to figure it out. You know, So in one respect, what you do is what you do, which means if you commit to being an online-only gallery, then that's what you're going to be. And I think that's fine. Where I find myself or with Nucleus is for us, just the physical aspect is so much of who we are. And I like having that. There's an anchor in a way. I mean, perhaps what we're discussing is like, you know, the future growth of Nucleus. And I would love to sort of have more of an online specific presence. Yeah, that makes sense. And it sounds like you're really enjoying hosting those events. I do. COVID has made me want to see people more. <laughs> I've never, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not a physical person, but I just, when I see people now, I just want to slap them on the back. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that having those in-person events and all those uh, show openings is like a very unique selling point for gallery in your clears? I think so. I think so. I know that from my employees, they all enjoy that aspect of it. You work months to put together a show. And it's not glamorous whatsoever. You know, it's really just a lot of checking up with artists, putting stuff together, marketing, shouting into the abyss, <laughs> trying to get attention. And then when you finally have the show, you get to see people, you get to see people's reactions, you get to interact with the fans. That part makes it worthwhile in a way. So have, not having that is like not as satisfying. <laughs> mm, yeah. I can see that. We've put up a few shows, including the one with you guys last year. I think every time people enjoy just to see each other's faces and just everyone get together, that in-person element is really hard to take away. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, like an event, it really d does come down to like an experience. I think, I'm sure online can have its own experiences, but like if you're just strictly like an online shopping network, that's different. That's not a unique experience. 
you might have some interesting experiences on like a zoom call or something like that but there's something you know you're, you're all your all your uh, senses are being stimulated when you're in you know at an actual event and things are happening mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah so what are other things that nuclear is is unique about i think we're still i still don't see that many galleries focused on entertainment art and i used to be like why but now i understand why because it's very hard <laughs> oh tell me more about that why i mean it's it just hard? it's not uh i mean you're in la you have you're surrounded by all artists in the entertainment industry what is it that makes it hard to put up a show or just do other things um it's hard in that the business of selling art is already difficult the business of selling entertainment art contemporary entertainment art is sometimes great sometimes not so great it makes the job exciting but um it can be you know it can it can take a toll on you sometimes I still think we're unique because we're one of the few galleries that do entertainment art, but not, we're not focused on pop culture per se. We definitely have a lot of pop culture, but our gallery is unique in that we're more about the artists. We're more about showcasing the people behind the scenes of like your favorite property or of like your favorite game or whatever. We connect the fans directly more to the creatives. I like to call it like blue collar artists. Nobody knows like who's, who did that texture map? Who cares? Or uh, who, who even designed the characters? Like, okay, to other artists, that's kind of glamorous, but to you know anyone off the street, like they don't care who designed that character. In a lot of ways, mm -hmm. entertainment artists are the blue collar artists of the art world. <laughs> yeah, it's just like there, there are so many people, so much effort put into just any piece of entertainment, but the consumers just only see the final product. You don't, you don't really know, or sometimes you don't really care. <laughs> All these props, <laughs> you actually have a prop designer. Background is different. Yeah, but see, when me and Angela look at like a prop, if we see a really good prop, like, ooh, that's a good prop. Who did that prop? You know what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. I, I like to tell people this joke. The first time I met Angela, I asked her what she did. And she says, oh, I'm a background designer for animation. My first reaction is, animation has background? <laughs> I go, like, what do you mean? Like, I, I only remember characters, conversations, probably. But I don't pay attention to background. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I did on Call of Duty. I was a background artist, you know? I built the uh -huh. background. Basically, the character is walking inside this whole level. That's That was all, like, what what our job was. That's interesting. So because you did that, you, you knew how much effort you put, or the team, or everyone puts into just designing that. And afterwards, you want to showcase that to the larger audience. Definitely, definitely. And then it, you started Nuclears. It's like, if look, if you've seen the Mona Lisa and liked it, and Mona Lisa is great and all, but like, just, you know, even Renaissance paintings, like a lot of people are like, oh, Renaissance painting. Then if you see some of the concept art from like Ian McKay, I don't care if it's digital. It's fucking amazing. Like, there's not that many people that can paint like that, traditional or digital, you know? Or like, <laughs> you look at the work of like Justin Sweet, that's basically contemporary renaissance painting um we just call it illustration now because it has a commercial purpose yeah but the skill and the level of like i don't know mastery it takes to make good concept art is i guess it became my mission to sort of like show it and educate the general public to this stuff and honestly like general public small percentage might care <laughs> most regular people still are just like oh interesting i didn't know that that's the end of the conversation but every time you have a show um, at least the friends and families will go and they would actually see okay oh this is what you do for work and not everyone knows <laughs> yeah. and then they would tell more people and that's how like more people are gonna find out i do think you know i do want to give ourselves credit for educating the public for as long as we have i think a lot of parents you know, for example, if you're a child and you're into art and maybe your parents don't get it, but then they take you to Nucleus and they look at all this stuff and they look at the amount of fucking space devoted to one artist and 
they're like, wow, okay, maybe this is a career possibility, you know, like in that way, we've kind of changed someone's life. I like that. I, I, I genuinely mean, we've definitely inspired people. Mm-hmm. And I think there's definitely a lot of people off the street that learn, <laughs> that realize like, oh, this is, this is art or learn something about entertainment art. Yeah. yeah, that's a very meaningful purpose for nuclears. I'm glad you're thinking about that too. That's, that's awesome. Um, speaking of the shows and helping artists get jobs, <laughs> how do you define um, a successful show? Sell everything. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess there's only really two definitions. One, either a lot of people show up, the attendance is high, and the response is good. So if like the, a lot of people are talking about it afterwards, if I start seeing a lot of YouTube videos about it or, or if there's just social buzz about it, that's one indicator of success. Uh, and the second indicator is the obvious one, if you know, it sells well. Yeah, I think that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> well, by this definition, you have a lot of successful shows. Then. <laughs> yes and no. Sometimes you have one success and not the other. And so when you have both, it's definitely the, um, the ideal you know, we've had shows where lots of people will show up and look at the art and like are amazed by it and talk about it, but maybe it didn't make as much, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What was the most successful show on top of your mind right now? The one that usually comes to my mind is the Cora Avatar exhibition that we had. That's the one that sticks out the most just because it has a lot of peaks. There's been others. I'll have to think about it a little bit, but I think the Cora Avatar show you got like celebrities coming, you got the creators there, you have uh, attendance. I mean, it was over a thousand people on opening day. Wow. Uh, you got like guests crying because, <laughs> because they're so emotional at, at meeting other fans and meeting the creators. You've got like tons of cosplay. It was like Comic-Con on crack, but, but for one p- property, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I got to I got to meet Grant Imahara there, and you know the sales were good too, because there's so much like fervor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When was that? Was that 2018 or? That was 2015. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like uh, not long ago. <laughs> Five years is I mean I don't know. To me, in some ways, it feels like a long time ago, and in other ways, I was like, oh, that that happened. Just like yesterday or something. That's so it's a, that's, still the winner. <laughs> that's 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 one of the winners. Uh, Square Enix Final Fantasy 30th anniversary. That's a big one. Um, we had a lot of big fans come out. It's the same same thing again. Like over a thousand people showed up. I stopped counting after that. Uh, that was memorable because we did something slightly like the the upstairs. We had we were able to get a copy of every game of every final fantasy game so going back to like super famicom you know and we framed every single game and put it on the wall and made like a physical timeline there was like two timelines there was the japanese games and the american games and i didn't even know this and i was learning as i was going and you know (laughs) but just seeing it i mean i could hear people in the other room you know like my office is right next to the upstairs gallery you can tell when people are spending more than a minute looking at stuff, they're really engaged. Because generally people, if they don't know or understand the art, like most people are scared of like museums and galleries. They'll walk into a room, go look around. They won't even get close to the art. They'll just kind of look at this, the whole room and then they'll leave. That's like, I want to say like 80% of the guests who are just off the street. The fans will take the time, but... The fans really took their time on this one and they would like look at every game and like, oh, I remember when this one, you know, I was this old when I played this game. And being able to evoke that emotion, I think is something that's, that's really interesting about the job. Okay, I'll give you a random tidbit. Like, I'll try not to cry. <laughs> we had a uh, ex-employee and she had an art show. It was like her graduation show, right? And she had won a grant to travel to Japan to do this art show, art project. So her thing was, okay, so basically her dad passed away when she was like pretty young, but she remembers him well enough. Like, I think he must have been like 10 or 12 or something like that. And so basically her trip to Japan was to like 
meet her dad's brothers, family, and basically trying to recollect her memories. And so the whole show is just like her memories and her trip. And there was not a dry eye in the room. Everybody was crying. I didn't know a show could do that. You know, that changed my life. I was like, I can't. There's everyone in this fucking show is crying. There's not a dry eye in here. And for me to see a show be able to do that, I've never, I've never seen an art show do that. If I can invoke laughter or, you know, sadness, fright, whatever, just to give people an interesting experience. I, I didn't realize that's what I was doing, but like, essentially, that's what we're kind of, I think at the peak of it, if you're trying to do uh, an interesting art show, you're really just trying to give people weird experiences, memorable experiences. But also authentic. Like this one's very personal mm-hmm. and everyone can relate to it. That, that's why it's just so good, so moving for yeah, people. Yeah. If we can even get like a kernel of that into some of our shows, I think that to me is another form of success. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Third box, make the audience cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, laugh would be good too. A lot of shows that, yeah, of are, that are really, really funny. It sounds really fun to me that you get to see all those shows and you plan them to get to talk to all these artists, which is that's like one of the favorite part of your job. Talking to artists is definitely my, one of my favorite parts of the job. I want to help artists. I want to promote their work, right? By putting them in the space, I want to show the general public. I said, hey, this is worth looking at. I also, in some ways, I'm trying to protect the artist and to nurture the artist. So by nurturing, I mean like giving them the opportunity, but also assisting them in this in getting their work out there, allowing them to sort of just be themselves and to just make the work that they want to make. But like a part of it is like not having to worry about the business side as much. Because I guess like a lot of artists, they want to have a show. They want to know like, hey, if I did my own fine art, what would that be like? You know, part of the reason the gallery started too is because a lot of artists that we were talking to, a lot of my friends, they were like, I want to do my own thing, you know, in air quotes. <laughs> and every, every, there's always an artist who wants to do their own thing. And I think that's totally fine. I'm not knocking that at all. I think everybody has to have their own thing. But oftentimes, like, we, Nucleus wants to allow, the, give the artist the opportunity to do their own thing. And for artists, sometimes it's like their own show. You know? uh-huh. Can they pitch you? Can they pitch you an idea saying, oh, I have like a, a few, let's say, background ideas for my story, but I haven't finished all of them. But if you can book me a time next year, I can work on it and deliver all this work. <laughs> can they do that? Do you trust them? <laughs> for somebody I worked with before, I definitely would probably be more inclined to trust them. Okay. It just depends on the artist. I mean, I've had... Like I've had artists saying like, oh, I want to, I want to put out a fashion line and I want to do it through a show. I'm like, okay, that sounds fun. Here's how I think we can do it. And then I would try mm-hmm. to work with them, lay out the steps. I would maybe even help them produce a couple of the of things. Yeah. You're like a, a marketing agency <laughs> for, for certain artists. <laughs> like they can just come up with an idea and then you can help them kind of package and promote. Yeah, like, okay, like I'll, I'll sometimes I'll encourage artists to make more than what they were originally thinking of, right? So I'm like, okay, well, you want to do fashion line? Well, how about this? How about that? What about this product? And they're like, oh, I didn't think about that. Or for an art show, I'm like, well, how about, how about a book? How about like a set of postcards or, you know, let's turn this into something else that could also benefit you, those type of things. That's also part of like the nurturing, I guess. Maybe nurturing is not the right word, but just coaching, guiding, you know. You're a creative agency in a sense, and every artist is their own brand. And you help them come up with ideas that the market might want, we want to see, right? Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, my, my friend who is in like marketing and ads, and he's the one that told me, he was like, yeah, dude, you're already doing it. I was like, what? He's like, have you ever thought about yeah. being a creative agency? I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. But here I am. I mean, I, I mean, we've worked with properties, like licenses, creating shows for them. In a lot of ways, we are marketing, a very specific type of marketing. You mm-hmm. know, where we've curated a whole fan art show 
our Spider-Verse art show, like some of that art turned into a, a, a book for Marvel, you know, like I'm unintentionally doing some of this stuff intention, intentionally as well. For example, the yeah. you know, Final Fantasy thing, you know, we worked very closely with them. We wanted to do it. So that, that's like a win-win there, you know, like that's the difference. Maybe that's the difference between us and an agency. You're like a one-stop shop. Like you create it, you can also exhibit it. It's like the execution is on your side too. Yeah. <laughs> do you always need to get a license from the studio when you work on a fan art project? Yes, yes. Anything that has that is like a, a property and an official, you know, we always try mm-hmm. to do it officially. I think what we do is we, we try to work a little bit closer with the property itself in the promotional aspects of it by having a show and by having things like that. There are a lot of companies out there that just sort of, they only focus on the product side. It's something that we can totally definitely, you know, we can definitely do, which is just buy the license, make some products and just put it out there. But I think we're kind of unique in that respect where we try to pair it up with, we try to package it, like you said, with other, mm-hmm. other aspects like an event, maybe even other products. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Personally, do you prefer to curate like a fan art show with already existing IP or do you like to have an original show? (laughs) My favorite, well, okay, I like both original and IP shows. Mm -hmm. Um, But in terms of IP shows, I do like the uh, the fan art aspect. However, for us, and this is kind of going back to like what makes us unique, I want to showcase, again, the behind the scenes artist. If I'm going to do a Star Wars show, I'm more interested in showing like the original concept art of Ralph McQuarrie or Doug Chang or, you know, those guys. If I were to do that licensed stuff, I would prefer to have a good chunk of it be focused on the original concept art and then the other, you know, remaining parts be fan art, tribute, tribute art, things like that. Makes sense. I can't say I like one better, more than the other. They're, they're kind of different. But I definitely never want to stop just saying, hey, so-and-so, I love your work. I want to see your personal work. And I, I'd love to have you in the show, kind of like what we did with Angela. Um, mm-hmm. And we're doing that with, with a lot more artists now, too, especially during quarantine for some reason. Um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, honestly, I, I do. I love showcasing just one artist, two artists sometimes, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's artists that we've shown since 2004, 2005 that we're still showing now. To me, at the end of the day, honestly, like, I like developing a long term relationship with these artists. Do you sign them? I don't. That's a good question because it's like, when I first started, that's another one of those business things where I'm like, do I need to do, you know, do I need to like make them sign things and, you know, lock them down. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized like, there's definitely galleries that still do that. And I think it might work for some of them. I'm not against signing people. I think if it works for you and you know how to enforce it, then go for it. But I've also heard stories where artists who were signed with certain galleries randomly pull out or just like doesn't doesn't uh, follow the contract Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like when you get to that point it's like a divorce like once you get to that point nothing you can do is going to salvage that relationship yeah and also sometimes galleries uh, are going for a specific style that that would limit like artists too that's what i heard from other um, fine artists (laughs) they were talking about how sometimes it's difficult to be represented because you have to tailor to the gallery's taste yeah i've I've heard of that as well Mm -hmm. i mean if you're as a gallery you shouldn't like i don't know i don't want to art direct (laughs) my artist you know what i mean (laughs) the fact that i'm picking you means i've already like just keep doing what you're doing I don't know. I, I, I don't want to art direct my, my artist too much. I think just small things like pricing structure or like, you know, once, once you have some data, you kind of know what works for that artist. But what works for one artist doesn't mean it's going to work for another artist. It's, it's kind of a gamble, honestly. You know what I mean? Like running a gallery, is, it's, it's kind of a calculated risk. Sometimes you have shows that do really well, and then sometimes you have shows that don't do well at all. You definitely believe in the artist and you've done all you can to sort of promote 
the show. But, you know, at that point, you're just kind of like, both people are kind of slightly embarrassed. And, the, and you know, the best you can do is just sort of like, do you, get, do, you, do you gamble on this again? Do you change the equation somehow, you know? Yeah, if I believe in the artist, I'll still, I'll yeah. still keep showing them in some capacity. So what do you think is the most difficult part of curating a show? Actually, pricing is pretty, it's up there. <laughs> Even me, you know, I have a difficult time pricing a show. Do you always price the artwork for the shows you're curious? I don't always price the artwork. Sometimes the artists pretty much have a price that they already want. They have an established sort of price. And sometimes that's fine, but sometimes I'll, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a conversation. Even when I price something, I'll you know, show the artist. I'm like, okay, is this price okay with you? So there's, there's, there's usually a back and forth. I would say that's definitely one of the most more difficult parts of curating. The one other part that's, that could be difficult at times is um, having to bug the artists. Um, you don't want to annoy them, but sometimes you just need an answer or you just need certain things that could be difficult sometimes. And then marketing. Marketing is definitely one of the hardest parts. Mm. Yeah, some shows are more easier to market than others for various reasons, but uh, marketing is always, you, you just feel like you're shouting into the abyss. Yeah, but for marketing, you really use your own channels, right? It's, uh, you don't we, do. we do. We do. We have our newsletter. We have our social media. That gets decent coverage. But to me, like a good campaign is like if, if people start talking about the show before the show, if there's like articles written about it and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, know, you, you send out press releases and often, most times you, you just don't know. Maybe you'll hear back, maybe you won't. Okay, another question regarding curating shows. So how do you take diversity into consideration? That's a good question. I've always, I've felt like we've always been aware of diversity. We, we try to pick our artists based on the quality of work. Majority of the time, I don't know if this artist is a female, a male, or what, whatever ethnicity they are. I mean, sometimes you can tell by the name, but majority of the time, like, that's not what we're looking for and not what we're looking at. So in that respect, we're just looking for good artists. Yeah. It's, hard, it's yeah. hard enough finding artists, just good artists with unique voices within the entertainment art world already. I do want to show more artists of color. It's never been an issue before you know we've always shown different types of artists yeah i just don't want to seem in, in, in genuine i think the best thing i can say is if people look at our past shows we're showing artists from all over mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah to, to answer your question i feel like we've always taken diversity into into account but we still prioritize quality yeah yeah it, it's just a. Uh... Maybe there are some marginalized groups, uh, the artists, they are not represented in the mainstream media or even on social media. Even if they have good work, you might not see it that often. So, but it's, it's kind of difficult for you to discover them to begin with. It, it's like a chicken and egg problem. I think what you said about like being more aware of it, that's enough. Like you said, you don't want to be engineering uh, when you go out to search for artists either. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, we're still just looking for good art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's all that matters. So everyone needs to work hard <laughs> to get the opportunities. <laughs> yeah. So um, next section is about how do you measure business success for nuclears? I know you have one franchise store in Portland. I heard from the other podcast that um, the owner of that store used to work for you and they moved to Portland and wanted to start their own and you really trusted them. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. I mean, he, he was like one of my first employees. Mm -hmm. um, but he, his background is graphic design and his wife is also a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. and they're just you know they're just really cool people and we even after he uh he quit we always stayed in touch and then i think one day this reached out to me and you know told me that he wanted to move to portland and was thinking about starting this thing so that's pretty much the the beginning of it i mean i've had people talk to me about franchising nucleus before it honestly it's not something that i wanted to 
I like I've thought about it and I've entertained the idea, but it's such a unique business. Every month is like so different than the next. For a franchise to work, you have to have like complete predictability and consistency. We're not selling Subway sandwiches. We're, just, you know, this is like, this is art. You, you, what you get this month, you may not get the same thing next month. So, um, mm-hmm. I only agreed to it because it was him and her. But mm-hmm. honestly, I think I think they've done an amazing job. They're thriving. They've very much taken it and made it their own. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, franchising is a bigger question too. Like I've thought about still growing it in some other respects. Mm-hmm. Like I would love to have a gallery in Japan. I would love to have a gallery in France. I'd love to have you know maybe one on the East Coast. That's about it. There's not that many other places that I can think of that I really want to open another gallery. But the thing, <laughs> like I don't, you know, I know how difficult it is to run one. You have to be yeah. really passionate to be a franchisee. I think a lot of people may not realize the amount of work that it takes to run a gallery. That's why, again, it's like there's not that many out there or they run them for a couple of years and decide it's just it's too much work. Mm-hmm. Then what are your measurements for success? It's more about like your measurements for gallery nuclears. Like what are your KPIs like <laughs> every year? What are the objectives you, you set for yourself, for your employees? Yeah, employee turnover. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, you know, how much, how well we're doing financially, how much sales every month. We do have monthly sales goals. I think followers, social response. I mean, other than that, it's really just comes down to like financial KPIs, you know, certain product categories, yeah. which yeah. one's doing well, which one's not. What about the size of the business? Do you look to expand the physical space or do you look to expand the activities you so currently I, I, have? I think I used to think that was a sign of success, but I, for me, success, okay, I'll, I'll break it down real practical for you. Mm-hmm. So to answer that question properly, for every business, your only sign of success should be how much you're profiting and the amount of time that you're allowing to give yourself. If you're profiting and doing well, great. But if you're spending 24 hours at work, that then you're not, then, you know, it's not worth it. It's the balance of being profitable and yet still having work-life balance. I mean, not just work-life balance for me, but for all my employees, you know, I don't want any, anybody getting burned out. I used to have like a very much art center work ethic and I still, still do, which is like to just work, 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 work. But I wasn't working like as smart back then, you know? Yeah, you're right. Like what you're saying, like you can't always make more money <laughs> you can you can work like 24 hours like seven days non-stop to make the most money you can but you you need to have a balance like how much time you want to put into work and how much time you enjoy life so that's a very good goal or a good measurement actually yeah, yeah. i mean I, I guess i would like to have like i mentioned earlier maybe more locations but it's not really the top priority for me <laughs> How many vacation days do you have right now? Whenever my wife feels like is necessary. <laughs> I don't know how many vacation days. When she says, okay, I think we need a vacation. All right, then that's my vacation day. <laughs> how about for your employees? How many days a year do they get? You talk about every week we get, you know, every, every week we get two days off. Pretty standard. Um, and right now with COVID, you know, we're not even coming in every day. We're all coming in like every other day. But yeah, like I've known businesses that they'll gross several million a year, but their quality of life isn't that much better and doesn't mean that they're necessarily profiting more. I think that was like a hard lesson for me to learn as well, you know, working so hard and trying to make more. But sometimes you realize how there's a lot of stuff that you can cut out that isn't worth your time. That's an ongoing process. I think every business is just continuously learning that. It's like work hard, but also work smart. Yeah. 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 And what, what is your vision for nuclear in three to five years? I do want to expand to other aspects of the business. I, I'm curious about possibly getting more into like printing and framing as a service. Right now, it's something we do, but we don't really offer it to the general public. We'll offer it to like a few artists here and there. and But... I feel like there are a lot of general public that appreciates that service aside from artists. I don't know. I say I'm curious because perhaps it's worth doing. Perhaps it's not. You know, I'd have to look into it further. 
it's a little more straightforward of a business than than like you know it's less subjective than say like finding good artists and marketing right right i don't know right. it has to make sense though i don't i'm not uh, i'm still exploring it I, honestly i just want to keep doing it. i mean i can i can't i don't honestly i don't know what the five-year goal is but i can tell you what like the 50 year old 50 year goal is which is that i want to be an institution um i want to continue like i want nucleus to be in alhambra for like 100 years from now maybe have like another one or two shops next door maybe one focused on like children's books and, and children's illustration and another one maybe focus more on like comics or something like that growing slowly and just becoming an institution continuing to do what we're doing now but like you know 50 100 years into the future that sounds awesome well maybe it's time to talk about your other priorities <laughs> Uh, maybe you can explain how your artistic background helped you with your business first, and then we get into your pursuit right now. Yeah, my artistic background, in some ways, is it is my business. You know, it's very much entangled with my business. It's helped me create my business. It's that's what my business is. The, the interest of the business came from. It's definitely given me sort of a different eye. It's not even just me. It's it's just like what the overall aesthetic and I'm, I'm more in tune as an artist so to the, to the sort of like stuff that is out there. And I do think about cr problems a little bit more creative, like differently than other people, I guess, in some respects, honestly, like being too much of an artist and trying to be a business person, it could be a detriment because there has been times. I remember the first three years, it was very much like me trying to, still doing all the do all the art aspects like design all the flyers i actually saw that you did a lot of artwork for the first few years like you're showing your artwork in those shows you're curating i've only ever shown in a couple of shows i remember like i put a couple of pieces in a bruce lee tribute art show another show mm -hmm. that i was really proud of uh, you know talking about successful shows we had bruce lee's daughter shannon lee at the at the gallery I, I'm a huge Bruce Lee fan, so I had to do something for that show. <laughs> um, like it was like the first couple, the first couple of years. I still want. I was still very much an artist, mm -hmm. and I wanted to do something. But as the years went on, I just became too busy, and I didn't really. But yeah, like uh, you know, in the early days, I was trying to like do everything that was creative. So like marketing and designing the, the, the social media flyers. It's just it was too much. That's what I meant by like working hard versus working smart. It's not even working smart. It's just you realize like, oh, this is eating much more of my time. Like I shouldn't be the one doing this. I should be the one trying to like grow the business in other ways. Yeah, those are all tough lessons to learn. So in that respect, uh, being an artist was kind of a detriment to the business. You wanted to take a lot, of, a lot more creative control over the stuff you were producing? Understandable, yeah. Yeah, learning to delegate, learning to... To relieve release controls has been like a ongoing lesson. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think most people who go to business school naturally, it's just like people who go to art school understand color theory. They understand there's just certain things that like you just jump ahead because you've learned these things, you know. Yeah. Whereas with business school, like I never went to business school, so it took me like maybe seven to ten years before I read that specific book that tells you like, no, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you know other things. Um, people went to business school with it. <laughs> so like your art taste, they, they can't get that right away. Yeah, I think yeah. the taste aspect is definitely something that's affected my business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned that you are into a lot of different forms of art. And based on our conversation so far, you mentioned a lot of different artists. So how many forms have you tried personally? Me, I've only ever done uh, entertainment art. I mean, I guess I've like done mini comic, pretty much all within the realm of illustration. And what do you still do right now? So you're like the, you're one of the first people to hear about this, but I'm going to have a children's book come out in May of 2021. Wow. Congrats. So that's what I've been, as far as creative endeavors go, I should, I should back up a little bit. I want to mention that I worked on Wish Dragon as a uh, visual development artist and a little bit as a storyboard artist. And, you know, that was very much attributed to my friend, Chris Applehans. Uh, yeah, got to, so I got to do a little bit of art. And that was about like 
more than three years ago. <laughs> um, after doing that, I pretty much focus on Nucleus. I want to say since 2015, 2014, basically like around the time my daughter was about to be born, I got inspired to, to write and to make a children's book. I just felt like, okay, with my daughter coming, I felt like I had license to create a children's book because I felt like I had something to say. You know, it's been like a five to six year journey to finally have a book published. Five years, including like finding the publisher and everything. Yeah. So the steps were like first writing a story that I felt comfortable and like confident in that took forever. And then, cause that was just me working on like weekends and then finding an agent took a while and then once i found the agent showing her and getting her approval so i was doing a couple of iterations after that that took a while that's already like i don't know probably two years into it and then finally getting it to a point where my agent felt it was ready to be shown around or she felt confident enough to, sh to shop it around and then getting an editor interested and then once the editor was interested another year or two of revisions and like rewriting the story so all that adds up added up to like when i was actually finally started painting the book it had already been close to five years probably around five years ah so you finished painting very yeah, it's, it's done it's, <laughs> it's pretty much done um i have like really minor things to do on it still but the bulk of it like i would say like 95 percent of it's done it'll be out may of next year that's great so you're still like fine tuning and like adjusting everything. But after this project, do you have another thing lined up? Or well, you two? Do another children's book. Oh. Yeah, I would like to do another one. Um, I have some ideas that I'm I'm pretty excited about. But yeah, you know, I hope it doesn't take another five years. It shouldn't. It should be yeah, easier. I hope for it. You. I hope it takes like you know no longer than two. So there's that, and then you know with nucleus. I do have Nucleus in a lot of ways is my creative outlet. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, the type of shows that we have putting together, curating a show is a creative process. For example, I have a, we have an exciting show in December, which is called fantasy arcade. And it was born out of the quarantine. So I was thinking about different things. And I was like, I want to see people like make their own like fake arcade machine. What if we made miniature versions that artists can design on and paint on? Once I got the idea, I started like, it got stuck in my head and I got more and more excited about it. And so I made my own prototype once like I glued it together and put the stickers on and everything. And I was like, wow, this is actually, this could be really cool. And then we, you know, now we're inviting musicians to actually write original music for these games that, that don't, you know, you can't actually play them, but they just look cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If you think like that, then <laughs> a lot of your gallery nuclear stuff is your creative pursuit. <laughs> You're just doing it. For both purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I had this question, like if you have to estimate what is the ratio of your time spent on your art versus your business operations? My personal art? Yeah. I guess you could count the creative time you spend coming up with ideas for new shows. <laughs> well, that's kind of a it's two different questions. I mean, for okay, for me working on my own personal children's book stuff. It depends where I am in the process, but that takes up maybe, I don't know, like anywhere from 25 to 30, 40% of my brain. Um, Time-wise, you know, if I'm in the middle of, of painting or drawing a book, I'll, I'll take more time. But I would say majority of the time, my brain is focused on nucleus and mm. upcoming shows and, you know, upcoming products and things related to shows. I guess the question I had earlier, like on this one, I was trying to figure out which part is like the process, like kind of like logistics things, non-creative tasks you have to do every day. Oh, versus, that's a lot. <laughs> versus I mean, the creative stuff you do. Yeah, luckily, I, I mean, I've learned to delegate that a little bit more. You know, when I first started, it was like, I would hang the art. I would go pick up the, you know, run to Home Depot like two, three times a week. I would paint the walls. I, I did everything, you know, uh, that was back in the day. I mean, I don't, I don't really do that now, but a lot of it is still like customer service issues come up. Um, I think the bulk of my day is really just everything that evolves around a show, setting it up, 
managing the expectations of the guests, the customers, you know, what our offerings are for the show, what the artists' expectations are, and just trying to execute the show as well as we can. So that's pretty much where all my effort goes to. And then you know, the rest of it is like just planning the future shows. That's good that you delegate all those tasks to other people to your team so yeah. you can focus on the bigger pictures. Yeah. You also mentioned in the other podcast I listened to it, the illustration department. Mm-hmm. You said that you're still not used to calling yourself the gallery owner or gallery founder. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I don't. I don't even feel good about. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that I don't feel good about it. I, Again, I'm not used to it. <laughs> I'm not used to it. Yeah. Even talking to you now, like it's weird. Like because to me, okay, it's like this. I don't. I may have been the founder. I can, I think I can say that pretty confidently. But to me, there is a degree of anonymity that I, I would prefer to have. Also, so much of Nucleus is not, I don't want people to think that it's like all me. It's not all me. It's a group of people. I may be sort of overseeing a lot of it, but. Are you talking about the business partnerships or like no, just, investors? Just, no, no. I'm just talking about. There are no investors. I'm talking about my team. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. My team, you know, past employees, all that stuff, like they're the ones who very much uh, helped me make, made Nucleus what it is today. You know, a right. lot of time, a lot of the ideas is, is uh, attributed to, to previous employees, execution, everything. I'm definitely part of it, but I do owe a lot to them as well. So I don't want to be seen as like the sole face of it. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's very humble. but are you comfortable calling yourself introducing yourself as an artist i am now (laughs) that's you know like uh, even telling you that i've made a children's book is still something that i'm getting used to because i haven't been an artist i've sort of had to squash that aspect of my life or this that part of me out to become a better business person well how do i say this if you work for somebody as a plumber that's great. But then if suddenly you become, if you start your own plumbing business, you shouldn't be a plumber anymore. You know, you're, you're actually running a business now. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But a lot of plumbers told me they run a business. They're the owner. <laughs> they still work. <laughs> They're a smart team. <laughs> yeah. But if they want their business to be really big or successful, yeah. they would stop being a plumber and actually just be business people. Yes, yes. But you don't want to lose that because you sounded really excited about the children's book. No, I am. I am. Uh, I'm, yeah. I, what, I'm, what I was trying to say was I'm able to say that I'm an artist again. I, I can say like more specifically, I'm a children's book writer and author. I'm a writer and illustrator. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I have it in hand, I'll be able to say with more confidence, Nucleus is still very much my priority or very much what I identify with. But I want to be seen. I want to start being seen as an artist again. You are always an artist. You just didn't do art. You didn't focus on making art for a bit. But now you're getting back to it. So having this artist title back would make you feel different. And then you're going to have new things, new ideas too. For yeah. nuclears, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about when you are working with artists? When you're choosing an artist to work with, does their social media popularity matter to you? That's a good question. It doesn't matter, but it definitely helps. We've shown artists with little to no social media presence, and some have done really well. Yeah, honestly, like having a social media presence makes the choice easier to want to show someone. It shows that they're serious about their work. It's like an online portfolio. You're putting out a series of work. You're saying, okay, this is what I want to be known for. You know, it's not so much like, oh, I'm, I'm marketing myself. It's actually you branding yourself unintentionally by like putting your best foot forward. You know, mm-hmm. anyway, it's like practice. So have you had the experience where you had to convince a very Instagram popular <laughs> artist to work with you to show their work? What if like they, they're just really popular? They, they also sell stuff online by themselves? You know, I've learned after a while that there's certain artists, if they don't want, if there's pushback, then there's only so much you can do. And I've learned this from other people who've been in the business for a while. It's just that 
if they don't want to show with you, you don't want to show it. I mean, why, why put in the effort? Do you know what I mean? In the end, it's like a lose-lose situation. If you have to try that hard to convince them, like I would prefer to working with people that want to work with us. <laughs> I do. Okay. I do a lot of convincing. Yeah. Honestly, like you were asking me earlier, like how much of my job is you know, more nuts and bolts. A lot of it is asking, just writing emails like, hey, do you want to do this? Hey, what do you think about this? Um, <laughs> I do do a lot of convincing and, and mm-hmm, trying to sell, mm-hmm. but there is a line and I have to have like retained some integrity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, not, I guess convincing might not be the right word. I'm just trying to say like lure them <laughs> into working with you. I guess. Oh, oh, are you asking me how? Like, how, yeah. How do you convince like the digital native artists? They were like, everything's digital. Everything's online. Why do I need to work with a physical gallery? To show my work you know have you met anyone like that or not not really yeah yeah definitely definitely i convinced them the same way i convince any other artist which is we love your work we'd love to have you know have you in our gallery for either this show or that show and uh there's really no special technique other than just being honest and being nice and hoping that they're they go to our site and, and like realize like oh this is something that's worth their time you know what i mean yeah for the foreign artists do you usually get their original like traditional artwork we try to yeah it's harder to work with foreign artists simply because there's more room for error for damage artwork uh it's more costly to ship things framed it's really stupid things like that but yeah we contact artists uh from the other countries all the time Mm-hmm. and uh, some of them have heard of us some of them haven't it's very rare that we'll offer a solo to a digital only artist it's very rare i mean you have to be like like for example who's that artist run run jia r-u-a-n-j-i-a like he's pretty much known for being digital or like craig mullins you know what i mean mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah we'll do a digital show with him <laughs> but <laughs> But mostly it's, it's, uh, it's traditional. Right, right. Even for the IP shows, you turn to encourage artists to, to create traditional art, right? Because I've been to a couple. Yeah. yeah. But you're okay if some artists are like, but can I just give you digital painting? You'll be okay too. <laughs> it depends on the show. But yeah, mm-hmm. I think I've, we've become a little bit more relaxed with that stuff. Okay. Especially if it's like a licensed show. I, you know, I'm very I'm, uh, empathetic of the artists because I know, like, if they're on a tight deadline, they don't have time to, like, pull out the paints and really kind of fuss with it. And painting is fun, but it, it, it really does. Like, you need to take time with it. It's different, slightly different process than digital. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Do you see fewer people do traditional paintings now? Mm-hmm, definitely. Does that, does that make your work harder? <laughs> make your job harder (laughs) yes it does but it also makes them work more coveted it's more noticeable when i'm trying to curate a large group show but there's still like the artists that we really like and follow a lot of them are still very like traditional based um even for my own book for my own children's book i was thinking like oh i got it I'm going to do this digital just for time and for the technique. Like you can get much more vivid colors in digital and you're much more accurate. You know, you can really tweak those things. <laughs> but then I was like, no, no, I got to take my own advice. So I ended up doing the whole thing traditional. Wow. That's, that's good. Did you use the watercolor? I Wash? use acrylic. Okay. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to showing you. You still think that buyers or collectors, they're still into traditional painting? Yeah, without a doubt. They'll buy digital. Don't get me wrong. People will buy digital work. They're just yeah. not going to pay the same price. And based on your business data over the years, like, do you see certain art styles sell better than others? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, this is kind of like a fine art. There was a fine art... Uh, thing written about this someone who who uh, who did a project on it and their whole fine art was a, a list of things that sell well that was the, <laughs> the art itself and uh, i found a lot of it to be true for example animals 
<laughs> nature, nudes. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you're talking about like what sells better, males or females? Females. <laughs> Brighter colors usually tend to do well. You, t- you know, we're, we're talking about more of the general population, mm-hmm. right? If you're talking about general population, people, that's why the Wyland galleries, Kincaid galleries, that's why they're, they can survive because that's exactly the, those, those things that they hit. What's the best selling uh, painting size? <laughs> it's different for different galleries, though. You know, I think for our gallery, it's, it's, more, it's more like a 12 by 16 or 11 by 14, somewhere around that range. Including the frame or not? That, that's an awesome question. <laughs> <laughs> including the frame or not? Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> not including the frame. So it'd okay, be slightly okay. larger. I mean, within that range, you know what I mean? Like, honestly, I do tell artists, like, I want you to paint within this size. No smaller than this size, no bigger than this size. Uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. There's few artists will make exceptions for, but generally I know it's almost like a, a price range that I'm trying to aim for. If you're a huge blue chip gallery, you want pieces that are like $10,000 a piece, $20,000 a piece. But some blue chip galleries, they can sell pieces that are like, you know, tiny and still charge like 10 grand for it. These mm-hmm. are like the galleries that like show the Damien Hirsts, Picassos. Yeah, yeah. That type of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I guess I was kind of talking about traditional painting, so... Maybe I'll touch on warrior painters as well. <laughs> warrior painters is known for plein air painting, and we gather people around to do plein air yeah, painting. Yeah, I think what right? you, yeah, what you guys are doing is great. Yeah, but we struggle to find places to showcase the work because we're not all expert, like great artists, like like people showing at the Autry or <laughs> other places. Um, how do you think we can work with? galleries basically as a group i think you have to find the right gallery <laughs> i mean honestly i know there was one in pasadena that was like focused on landscape paintings and things like that but mm-hmm. i don't know that you can necessarily do it as a group either a gallery may be interested in like a few artists out of the group i don't know it's, it's, it depends it's like galleries are such an individualistic thing there's there's not there's no one way to work with a gallery Mm-hmm. I, think, I think it helps to develop a relationship with the gallery owner. <laughs> you got to educate them about what you do as a group. If you're trying to showcase the group itself, that's different than showcasing individuals within the group. But I, I think there's definitely certain galleries that will show your work much easily than other galleries. There, there used to be a lot, of, a lot more galleries in Pasadena and L.A. that focused on like landscape art. You know, mm-hmm. I think their California Arts Club is huge. They paint together all the time. You get the, you know, those are like your me and C twos and your yeah, yeah, <laughs> Lee Roy and you know those guys. That's a tight group. Once you, you know, like twenty years from now, you guys. But are there all, are all the masters. <laughs> you know. What do you think you guys are going to be in ten, twenty years? <laughs> yeah, hopefully we're going to have some masters. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna, you're the That's next generation of those guys. You know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> Thanks for the confidence. <laughs> no, seriously. And plus, I mean, you've shown at a couple different warrior painters as a group has shown at a couple different places mm-hmm. that you guys have a history that they'll be like, oh yeah, I trust. Since you've already sold works out of the galleries, it helps a lot. I see. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, you can do another one on nucleus. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. After this, we're going to have a lot of quarantine-themed art. (laughs) Going back to some suggestions for artists to work with art galleries or work with you, do you have uh, some suggestions for for them? Like, is there anything that they should never do? (laughs) Um, All right. So the first thing is what makes good art? And second thing is what makes a good gallery artist? So what makes good art? One is presentation, the framing, the surface. Okay, if it's badly framed, that's not good. Surface, some people use weird spray fixes and chemicals to varnish their art and it messes up the painting. Um, where is it hung and how is it hung? That's all part of the presentation. And then there's concept and the idea. Does this work say something? 
Is it supposed to say something? You know, maybe it's just a pretty picture. That's totally fine. What is the intention of the work? Uh, social and cultural relevance doesn't always have to have a huge cultural relevance, but I think it's another level, another aspect of the art that not all people think about that can improve the artwork. Right. So it's like, how does this work fit in the greater conversation of society or what's going on or just within art, the art world? You know, because a lot of art is commenting on other art. So how does this work fit within that conversation? What makes this work important? You know, sometimes you want work that is reflecting, reflective of the times. And sometimes you, you want work that, that's more uh, universal, I guess. But I think most art should be reflective of the times. Uh, technique and execution, that one's obvious. Is it well painted? Is the mark making good and intentional? If there's happy accidents, does it look like it was an intentional happy accident? And then the last thing is hang ability. Is it pleasant to look at? Do I actually, is, I call it the hanging test. Sometimes I'll, I'll ask my coworkers, like, hey, would you put this in your house? And then, you know, it's very obviously, like some people will be like, yeah, I'll definitely put it in my house. And then some, some pieces you're like, oh, I really love it, but I don't want to put it in my house. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so what makes a good gallery artist? Okay, the ability to produce. Some artists are fast. Some artists are slower, but some artists are so slow that they can't put a show together in time. In that same vein, some artists are just flaky or inconsistent and can't produce. Okay, Consistency, can you produce the same quality over time? Or is it like all over the place? Different themes, different materials, all that stuff. Being able to be consistent is, is very important. Uh, are you easy to work with? You know, are you pleasant? Are you nice? Do you answer your emails on time? Which goes into my next one, respectful and punctual. Being on time and answering emails on time is very important. Like if, I, if the two artists had the same amount of skill, I would definitely choose the other one that's like easier to work with <laughs> if I had to only show one of them. Right, right. Um, and then going to uh, talking about marketing, I think self-promoter. A good artist is also a good self-promoter. And it's not that they're like doing all this crazy stuff. It's just like we talked about earlier, having some kind of social media presence because it shows them like, hey, this is what I do every day with my life. I'm an artist. I'm like posting this stuff. A lot of those artists, are, they don't have a social media presence because they have a full-time job. They're just too busy with their full-time job or they're focused on something else. You know, So it's not as important to them. Having some kind of a social media presence and having self-promotion shows me that this is important to you. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, that was very thorough. <laughs> that was more than I expected. Because <laughs> uh, I was just like, oh, is, is there anything they, they shouldn't do? Like when, when they email you, like certain things they shouldn't I'll mention. Say some, so. Yeah, I'll say something else. This is for all artists at contacting. It's not even just for artwork or galleries. Because what will happen is an artist will be like, they'll email us and they'll say, hey, I like what you do. Can I show you my work? And I'm like, you've already got my attention. You should have just attached it in your email. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't ask for permission at that point because <laughs> I'm not going to reply necessarily. <laughs> so just, that, just put the link. right there. Yeah, just put the yeah. link because that's what I would reply to and tell you anyways. Yeah, And it's because also because we have it in our FAQ section. It's like, if you're interested in submitting work, here's what you need to do. And this is, this is asking for approval for anything. Don't ask to ask for approval. Do you know what I mean? Right. Take the initiative. And yeah. Be confident, actually, in a way. Yeah. 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 So this it applies to a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, that was a lot for today. But <laughs> <laughs> I want to end on something uh, that's fun a little bit. I don't know if it is fun to you, but we want to know what are your other hobbies? <laughs> what are the things you do outside of work? Well, I mean, the children's book thing is definitely taking up a good time, deal of my time now. I mean, I definitely, I mean, I enjoy spending with my family. I try to spend some time with my daughter. You know, that's always like a constant balance of like guilt <laughs> like oh i'm not spending enough time with her or, oh i'm spending too much time with her i'm not spending enough time on my work or whatever 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've been doing a lot of, uh, but uh, what else? I try to exercise, stay fit. You know, I, I got into boxing like three, four years ago. So that's been fun. I think I was watching um, the Floyd Mayweather and McGregor fight that everybody was watching because it was so popular. And that really got, got me interested. I, I really didn't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not much of a sports guy, but since then I've started following boxing and just like YouTube continuously recommending me. They're like, you know, once you watch one, they're like, oh, how about this one? How about this one? And they're like, all right, I'll watch that. All right, I'll watch that too. They're like, well, if you watch that, you should watch this. Like, all right, YouTube, you've made me an expert. <laughs> So how, how do you keep that practice during quarantine? I basically let go of myself for like three months and then the gym reopened for one month and then it closed again, which sucked. But I'm proud to say that me and another person at the gym helped my, our coach to do Zoom, to set up Zoom classes. So I've been doing that every morning from Monday to Thursday. Honestly, I, I encourage all of your listeners to join in because it's free right now. <laughs> anyone with the zoom link can do it i'm trying to promote his class it's awesome it's super light it's not as crazy of a workout as if you were actually in the gym i mean it's a free boxing class what else can you ask for that's awesome you need to send me that link so i'll yeah. put it in the description <laughs> get on there we can work out together you'll see me on there sweating uh, this whole interview was just so that i can promote my uh, my boxing school <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah after talking three hours on your art and on your gallery now yeah. you're promoting for boxing right. class let's talk about what i'm really <laughs> passionate about <laughs> all right thank you so much thank you this was fun thanks for listening we love hearing from you Feel free to write us a review on Apple Podcast or other platforms, leave us a comment on YouTube, or just message us on Instagram. If you want to support us, please consider donating on Gumroad. You'll find a link in the description. Alright, see you again soon!